Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Welcome to part two of this 4K Q&A. My apologies for my continuing spotty presence here on BookTube. I just returned home from a bit of time visiting my brother in South Carolina, where we started going through a lot of my mother's papers and clothing, etc. We shared a lot of wonderful memories of her with each other, and we also got to talk a lot about books and music and food and travel. So now is the time to answer some more of the wonderful questions you all left for me. Let's start with one from my pal Alan at the channel Big Hard Books and Classics, which sort of ties in with my recent trip. He asks if I have any friends still from grade school. Sort of although I haven't stayed in close touch with friends from first grade in the next few years of elementary school, I have had a few online conversations with a couple of them, and I got to meet up with one of them in person a few years ago. Until that visit, a very long time had passed since I had last seen Carolyn. Both of us felt slightly awkward for the first few minutes, I think, but it was kind of remarkable how quickly we were able to tap into a friendship that basically got frozen when we were about 12 years old. I'm more in touch with some of my high school classmates, mostly via Facebook. Many of them still live in the coastal town where many generations of my family have lived and where my mother lived until her death. One of my fellow classmates, who left South Carolina to attend college and then established his life elsewhere, is now living at the beach again for a while because of his father's ill health. I am thrilled that we've been able to connect a bit, having dinner together a few times while I was there and talking about our current lives rather than just reminiscing about our high school days. Incidentally, I'm also back in touch with my favorite high school English teacher. So let's go into another question. Commenter extraordinaire Melissa, turned booktuber over at the channel Time Travel Reads, asks, if you were to talk more about history on your channel, what would you talk about? I'm not absolutely certain, actually. What I studied and what I wrote about was primarily the history of race, gender, and disability in the United States South during the late antebellum period and then after the Civil War up through the Jim Crow era that came to a head in the first part of the 20th century. I do keep up with scholarly university press books about that place and period to degree, but I think I think if I were to talk a lot about those books, I would lapse into academic jargon that wouldn't necessarily appeal to general readers. I have been pretty intrigued with somewhat more popular books about fields I don't know nearly as well, the medieval period in Europe, the history of the Middle East, etc. Right now, I have a couple of history books on my nightstand that are kind of related to each other books about another historical setting with a connection I'm not even going to explain right now, but which I think I might talk about on my channel sometime soon. Actually, this might be a good time to confess that I know shockingly little about the history of Britain. If any of you have a recommendation for a good book to get that very basic framework down, I'd love it if you'd leave your advice down in the comments. I was thinking that something along the lines of Peter Ackroyd's history series or some of Dan Jones' historical works, maybe. Does that make sense? Other recommendations? Lackvy asked a couple of questions. First, are there any books you read in your 20s that you think were especially appropriate for that time in your life? Well, how about Possession by A.S. Byatt? I was in graduate school when I first read it. And after the first few chapters, I started over, reading it aloud to my friend, David, who had just gone from being my study partner to, surprise, my boyfriend. That book meant a lot to us in those very early days of our relationship. And right after we married, several years later, we took that same book with us on our honeymoon to a little bed and breakfast in the mountains of Virginia. Lackvy's second question, are you still working on the book you started writing with your husband? Well, that's a hard question. 
I think the answer is yes. I've done quite a bit of thinking and organizing of new sections of what we were writing together with the knowledge that he might not live to finish it with me. When he died last summer, I knew I needed a few months to take care of legal stuff and house stuff, etc., etc., but also just to get myself back together to get some perspective. I was sure I'd be ready at least by the start of 2024. And then my mother was really struggling and I just froze. I still really want to finish our book, but it hasn't been easy for me. You know, David thought of me as the writer since I had published a couple of academic books before we got started. When he was first trying to put together his very first pages for the book, he had no idea how to get started. But that very quickly changed. He needed me as an editor, something I'm pretty good at, to help him reorganize his sentences so readers would be able to follow his stories. But what was totally magical was David's ability to just be really open and really honest. And when I was writing my first pages and my later pages, what I needed was not sentence level editing that I could do. What I needed was David saying, go further. Don't hang back from just laying it all out there. I mean, it isn't that I'm wanting to be dishonest or anything, and I really don't feel any need to be private even, but I am introverted and I needed his encouragement to be, well, to be a memoir writer and not an academic. So I really, really want to finish this book and I'm a little scared. Thank you actually for asking a question that made me say all this aloud. I hope some of you might occasionally give me a little nudge like this over the next few months. I think I could use a little encouragement. Okay, onwards with the Q&A. David, a different David, the one with the excellent booktube channel, Polyglot Reading, asks a fantastic question. Do you have any favorite or highly appreciated books among the German, Italian, and Yiddish classics? Do you read in any other languages than English? Well, I am a stereotypical monolingual American, or at least a monolingual reader. More explanation on that in a minute. I studied French casually in high school, just enough that I managed to pass the language requirement in college. And then four years later, I brushed up on my French, just enough to pass the language requirement in grad school. Interestingly, one of my grad school friends lent me her copy of Derrida in French to help me study for the test. I couldn't understand Derrida in English, so I thought she was nuts. But as it turned out, Derrida actually made sense in my elementary French. Totally unexpected. Of course, now I can again barely decode sentences in French and only very, very slowly. Okay, I said I was a monolingual reader. I did learn ASL, American Sign Language, at a fairly advanced level. I was a professor at Gallaudet University, a college for deaf students in the United States, and I taught exclusively in sign for several years. But it's been a long time since I taught there, and my signing skills have declined an enormous amount. And while there is an enormous storytelling tradition in the deaf community, that tradition is based not in writing, but in sign language. As for Yiddish, while I don't know the language at all, I'm intrigued by Yiddish literature, and I've read just a bit in translation, just really major Yiddish authors like Shalim Alechem and Isaac Weshevet Singer. I know there are a number of women who wrote in Yiddish, and I would love to read some of their books sometime. Do you have any particular recommendations, David? Jen at Jolly About the Book says, I love books with a strong sense of place where I feel immersed in the setting and culture. Do you have a couple of books that have evoked that feeling for you? Certainly, those Yiddish books, even in translation, have a strong sense of place. But I suppose I think about place even more in Southern literature. William Faulkner is a master at creating a sense of the culture of what he called his little postage stamp of native soil. I love Eudora Welty's somewhat less fraught picture 
of the same general area. Zora Neale Hurston is terrific at conveying a sense of the culture of a black community in rural Florida, and Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings was great at writing about the white culture there. And a writer from my family's own personal little postage stamp of native soil in coastal South Carolina is Julia Peterkin. She's not widely read anymore, but she won the Pulitzer Prize early in the 20th century, and her writing had some things in common with Zora Neale Hurston in some ways. I haven't read her work in decades, but I should, and I'd love to talk about her as an author a bit here on the channel. She is kind of a complicated story. Lee Kempter writes, you said when you visited Greg and Alan on their Monday night live show fairly recently, that you had a project that you were working on about Gilgamesh, anything new on that front. Well, I have made a video about Gilgamesh earlier, one that I put out last September as my response to Sumerian September, which I gather meant something entirely different to the founder of that event, Michael K. Vaughn. I haven't set things up yet for the larger project I have in mind, but I still want to do it. Gilgamesh would just be the first in that series. Basically, I was inspired by the book to prevent women in translation, to sort of turn it on its head. And instead of reading books written by women and then translated by anyone, I would read books initially written by anyone and translated by women. And the books I wanted to focus on were all ancient literature. I have a long list written out so far, starting with various translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey, Hesiod, the Greek plays, the Aeneid, etc., on up through Beowulf and Chaucer, maybe. This is going to be a slow project, and one I may not start until 2025. On to another question about a specific book. Pamela Christie asked this doozy, if Gatsby had been successful in pulling Daisy out of her husband's orbit, what do you think his existence would have been like? As a retired teacher, says Pamela, I've read and discussed The Great Gatsby more times than I can count, but I'm always left with the same impression. There was nothing in his life but his drive to be admitted to the upper class. He had no interests, no passions, other than Daisy, and she might have just been a means to an end. He wasn't a good conversationalist, and he didn't even seem to enjoy the trappings of his wealth. He was empty. So how might he have spent his days once he entered the hallowed ground? Well, maybe he would run for president. Not really, and I know the situation is quite different, but when I think about Gatsby and Daisy, I now sometimes think about Trump and Melania. I don't get the feeling that there is anything deeply loving in either relationship. I think your point about how Gatsby didn't even seem to enjoy his wealth is really true. And maybe that complicates how we interpret this issue. You say means to an end, but I'm not sure what the actual end is that he wanted. Was the money he acquired supposed to be the lure that could allow him to gain Daisy's love? Just to allow him to be in not just the realm of the mega rich, but also the more powerful old money upper class? Why did he want to be in that group? Respect, maybe? He didn't seem to care about political power in society. Or to turn your question around a bit, did he want to pass as upper class in order to get Daisy? But then why did he want Daisy? There's something about Gatsby that, well, Fitzgerald really doesn't portray him as deliberately cruel. And therefore, we as readers have a certain amount of compassion for him and kind of feel sorry for him, despite all of his wealth. I really want to read Gatsby this summer. My son does sound for theater, and he'll be working on a musical of Gatsby to be staged soon. I want to talk about the book with him a bit before I see the show. The Great Gatsby was one of the first grown-up books Abe read, and since he homeschooled, we talked about it a lot together back when he was, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, maybe. So perhaps we can reprise those conversations. Okay, on to a pair of questions from Dia of the excellent channel Novel Idea. 
She asks, what do you do, look for, or ask as you read to get beneath what is on the page? Is there a particular hook that never fails to capture you in a story? I have no idea, to be honest. I suppose I'm usually obsessed with trying to figure out what authors are doing to create the magic we experience when we read. Sometimes it's amazing prose, rhythm, repetition of a sort, poetic language. Sometimes it might be an author's use of symbolism. And I guess I'm usually on the lookout for that kind of imagery which conveys unstated meanings. And I think about allusions to other works, especially Shakespeare and the Bible, but usually I don't do any of that consciously. As for hooks that always capture me, I'm a total sucker for Bildungsroman type stories where we see someone struggle a bit and then mature into a deeper and more thoughtful character. I don't mean I need to see someone grow up from a young person into an adult, just that I like to see characters learn and grow psychologically over the course of a book. Does that make sense? Memphis Jones, who has a booktube channel I only very recently discovered called My Dear Blog, asks, do you have a method for analyzing the books you read in order to craft your well-prepared reviews? Annotation, note-taking, etc. Thank you. I do tend to write all over my books, at least if I'm not planning to give the book away after I read it. Back before I did reviews, I marked things I found really powerful or noted symbolism sometimes. I often made notes on sections that made me think, maybe persuading me of something brand new or leaving me confused and questioning, or maybe even making me want to have a little fist fight in the margins. Now that I write formal reviews, that particular kind of annotation can be pretty helpful when I'm trying to figure out what to say about a book. Also, I now make sure to mark passages that I want to share to give people a sense of the writing, something I never would have done when I was just reading for myself. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? I do want to make a whole video on this subject at some point. The Amazing Kim at the channel Middle of the Book March asks a couple of questions. First, have you always liked the same type of books? Pretty much, at least from the time I was a teenager. There have definitely been times when I emphasized particular kinds of books more than others, maybe going into a mysteries kick or reading mostly Victorian novels or studying American literature. But those choices are just a matter of emphasis, not a radical shift from one thing to a totally different kind of reading. What I'm interested in reading certainly gets larger and larger as I learn more and more. And BookTube has put that process in overdrive. So my interests are broader, but there haven't really been any major changes of direction in my reading. Kim's second question is really lovely. As a fellow wife and mother, was there ever a time in your life when you needed to slow down your reading to fit in real life? Absolutely. I can't quite imagine how that wouldn't happen with people who live with each other and care for each other. Over the last few years, when David was increasingly sick, I read quite a bit less than I have during most of my life. And actually, that slowdown happened at the same time that I was broadening my TBRs, which I just mentioned in response to your first question. So it felt like I was reading even less. It was a lower percentage of what I wanted to read. When I did pick up books, a whole lot of it was to read aloud to David. Often when I was reading to myself, I was sitting in the comfortable chair we set up right next to his hospice bed, and I was thinking just as much about David's breathing as I was about the book I was reading. And of course, being a parent definitely changed my reading practices too. I mentioned earlier that my son homeschooled and I made a commitment to read with him whenever he was interested in doing that with me. I don't mean reading aloud to him. I mean, each of us reading books that we would then talk about together. Sometimes just the two of us or the three of us and sometimes with friends or with our homeschool book club. 
I absolutely adored that reading, but it did mean that I didn't read as many books that didn't fit for him. That was especially true when Abe was in middle school. When he was even younger, I had an anonymous book blog where I was working through ancient literature and later classics, but at some point I decided I'd need to put that project on hold. And instead of having them as just my own project, perhaps I could read those with him as he matured when he was ready. During his middle school years, I definitely was reading a lot, but the books I read needed to be a little lighter things I could put down on a moment's notice instead of books I wanted to study more intensely. Well, I think that's a pretty good stopping point for today's video. I'll finish up this 4K Q&A next week in what I think will be a fairly short video. And I hope to have a different kind of video, maybe a tag or a book haul or a reads and rambles before that. Thank you so much for all the great questions, and thanks for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.